just had a wonderful conversation with Jen Hank, and she is actually an ed tech specialist at Lake Highland Prep here in Orlando, Florida. And we've connected through some mutual friends. And one of the things we talked about in the podcast is the idea of return on investment and the technology we're using in our classrooms. One of the things that I have struggled with is schools too often, and I'm known for my work on innovation, are trying to be on the cutting edge, trying to do the latest and greatest stuff. And so what happens is we are always trying to do new things, not necessarily paying attention to the stuff we've already been working on. And that's going to be an issue if we continuously do that. And yesterday I was working with a group in Atlanta Public Schools. And one of the things I said to them is, Basically, we shouldn't do stuff that we did in the past just because we've done it in the past, nor should we do new stuff just because it's new. We should focus on what works well with our students. And that's something that's really important to me. And as we get more and more comfortable with technology, we have to understand the technology is becoming way easier than it was when we were kids. I use the analogy when I was a kid, we had an Apple IIc And it was really hard to utilize. You had to know a lot of stuff, how to program, how to do these things. But now editing a video, it's basically just popping in things into templates. And it's only getting easier with artificial intelligence. And are we actually developing wisdom in our kids? Are we actually focusing on deep learning or stuff that just looks cool? And so Jen and I talked about that, why it's important that we actually focus on depth of learning and we look at return on investment in the technology tools that we use in our classroom. I'm not talking about return on investment in the terms of money, but the deep learning that happens because of the work that we do in our schools. She was a great guest, had some great ideas. I know you're gonna really enjoy it. Thank you again for uh, joining me on another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed today to have Jen Hankin. She is at Lake Highland Prep, which is, it's actually close to Amway Center where they're allowed to magic play, is it? Yes, we are, we are downtown. I love it. And so downtown Orlando, very close to me. You actually, you know what? I was Now that I'm thinking about it, you should have been my first in-studio guest. I have never had like someone actually yes. sitting in front of me. I've yes. always done this on you know, virtual. So we should have done that, but uh, there's always next time. There is always next time, right? Maybe we should start our own like Orlando education podcast, right? Oh my God, that'd be so much fun. (laughs) Well, I don't, I don't really know anything, but we'll see. (laughs) I, maybe if I got invited to some of your events that, you know, are in Orlando, Uh, you know, down from my house, whatever. So so, uh, Jen is done a ton of different roles. She has a, a tremendous experience. But before, instead of me telling you all that stuff, Jen, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us what you do, uh, who you are, and how you got there, it's a great place to start. Thanks, George. Um, I am Jen Hankin, and I, like he said, I'm currently at Lake Highland Prep, but my journey to get here was quite an interesting one. I started in public school teaching middle school math, science, and as a reading specialist, where I transitioned into being a learning specialist in an independent school where I got into professional development, which brought me to ed tech, which brought me to Lake Highland. Okay. So Hey, I like, this is kind of a, a really interesting thing for me because I actually trained to become an elementary teacher. That was the goal. I wanted to teach kindergarten and, and then somehow I got kind of placed into the educational technology space, um, the innovation space, Mm -hmm. which, which I actually, would argue are not necessarily the same thing, even though there's a perception, it's the same thing. And I think that's one of the things I'm really passionate about is we got to not just look at technology, but new and better ways of teaching and learning. But there is a reason I was kind of put into that techie area, but it wasn't like I trained, it wasn't like I trained to do this. I actually, what, what's weird. I, you probably, I don't know if you've ever heard this or you know, this story about me. I, we were, (laughs) <laughs> this is embarrassing. We were forced to pay $50 for a computer account in university. And I almost started a protest because I'm like, how what? dare you oh. make us use computers and like make us pay this extra 50 bucks a year. Like, this is so stupid. And I was so mad about it. 
And, and then to actually, you know, this is kind of just part of what I do right now. How did actually your roles as a reading specialist, learning specialist, how did that lead you into, you know, this area of technology? Cause that's, that's not necessarily no, a no, people perceive. They don't usually go hand in hand and people get really freaked out as I learned very quickly when you bring the two up. But so the school that I was at previously, they were going one-to-one. Right. right when I was starting and that one to one program started in the middle school. And as a learning specialist, I was trying to make studying more fun for kids who didn't like it. Right. And so that led me down the end tech path, which then put me into not just making it easier for my small group of kids that were struggling. But hey, if we open it up and broaden everybody's eyes, then everybody does better because you can show what you know in lots of different ways. Well, it's kind of like, so I remember this conversation and this is such a long time ago. So, uh, uh, one of my ex-girlfriends <laughs> like going on a weird path already. So one of my ex-girlfriends, her brother was probably the smartest person I've ever met with technology ever, like just a brilliant mind and could do stuff that I couldn't even imagine. And when he graduated, uh, from college, he was, he had job offers from both Microsoft and Google immediately. So these are, you know, the most well-known technology places in, in the world. Right. Yeah. And I, and I was just, and I'm starting to do like ed tech stuff and, you know, he, I just know this guy knows so much more than I do. And I remember asking him this question. I said, okay, out of 10, what would you rate yourself as like your knowledge in technology? And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, eh, it's probably a six. I'm like, you're a six. Like, that's what you're a six. What are you talking about? And he said, well, he said, in reality, there's so much stuff. Like there's so yeah. many things in the world for me to say, I am good with all of it would be a lie because I don't even know what's out there. I don't even know some of the things that are out there. I've, I've never seen, never utilized. So it's impossible for someone to actually be a 10 in this space. Now, if you put me in front of something, I could probably figure it out. And like, it was weird because his, his answer that he was a six and the way he explained it kind of made him a 10 in my mind. Do you know what I mean? Like it was such a, it, it made a lot of sense to me because it is when you say a learning specialist and then you are, you know, going to educational technology, to me, that's a very logical transition in the sense that when people say to me, I'm not really good with technology, my argument is, so you're not really good at learning because basically technology adapts. Like every time I turn on an app or a program, it honestly could look a little different from the last time that I utilized it, right? Like even, this is weird. I was downloading some files from my Gmail account and they always like download on the bottom of my computer. But the last couple of days, it's now going up top and I'm like, what happened? Like what's going on? So things always look a little different and you just gotta, you gotta actually understand how you adapt. So that to me is a very logical connection, but yeah. people have this notion that it's, you have to be like immersed in technology to understand technology. I'm like, no, you have to no. have a willingness to push. I, back, right? Yeah. I have, you have to be willing to learn. Right. Um, I was at a conference a while back at tiny conference and they, one of the keynote speakers was, uh, Tanya Averett, who I think, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Canadian. She, Canadian. yeah, <laughs> well, she used to live in Florida for a bit and I'm not sure if she's still down in Miami or not, but she said, um, to the room of people that were there to learn that the smartest person in the room is the room. Right. And that has resonated with me. And I love being in the ed tech space because that room is so open and sharing and giving that they're not trying to fight over each other about who knows what we right. just all learn from each other. Yeah. The, so my, my very first class, so I applied for a kindergarten position. I, I weirdly enough, I got a high school technology job out of it. This is the weirdest story and I'll tell it some other day, but they basically put me in a position that I knew a little bit, but not very much. And I actually remember, um, saying to the students in this class or at high school, I'm maybe 25 years old, 24 years old. 
don't really know much about technology. I'm like, hey, does anyone know how to do this thing? And the kids are like, I, I do, I do, I do. And they would show you. And it was kind of this this idea that you never want the kids to know what you don't know or that because it'll diminish you. They went out of their way to show me stuff. And they had such a pride that they felt like they had a con contribution to the room and to the teacher that it could help them. And it actually elevated myself as well as the other class. And one of the things I say is a, a hope for me um, in my, it, you know, when my kids go to school, what I expect for every school is that learners feel their contributions are necessary to the success of the classroom and the school as a whole. And what you kind of just described uh, is that, that aspect. And so when you look at some of the work that you're doing at Lake Highland Prep, how do you take some of that philosophy of basically what you're doing, you know, as an ed tech specialist, but your, your experience as a learning coach, like what are some of the things that you're doing and how do you get kind of people to embrace some of those things that you actually talk about that you're learning at these conferences and then actually implementing in your own school? Yeah. So I am very open with the fact that I don't know everything. Right. And I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, I'll look it up or I'll look it up while I'm standing there with them yeah. because um, working in ed tech, yes, I can talk Kahoot, I can talk quizzes, I can talk all the things, right? But people also think that you work in tech. Yeah. And when it comes to something like that, I don't know all those things. And so I think that I building that level of trust because I willingly admit that I don't know. And then I'm also a big person who believes in a bribe, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah that. I don't know where that's going. I, I, I bribe. So I always have um, like candy in my space so that yeah. they know that they can always come and get a treat. I'm a big giver outer of swag, uh, you know, because if you, if you feed them or if you give them something, they will come. Yeah. You know, so you actually remind me of something and it, it's, it's kind of a weird story to tell. Uh, when I was principal, my very first year at the school, uh, I was also basically the tech lead in the school. Now, I wasn't designated that, but it was just expected of me because of my comfort level with the stuff. And it was very, is something that came, I don't want to say it came naturally to me, but asking questions and digging into stuff and, you know, kind of figuring out that was kind of natural. So, you know, I was just, I was never, I was always comfortable with figuring stuff out if that makes sense. Yeah. And sometimes I'd be really, really fast. And then in my second year, there's a, there's a teacher there and he's, he's since passed away. He's someone I really, really appreciate. His name was Norm Usiskin. And he, he was very open to learning, but he struggled with a lot of stuff. Like, and I actually, but he, even in his struggle, he would always like try to figure it out. And I actually said to him, Hey, I'm going to actually make you the, the ed tech lead in our school this year. And he's like, Oh God, no, don't, don't make me this person. He said, you're, you're obviously the best fit. I said, no, but the, the problem I have here is people kind of just see me as I know all this stuff and they, to be honest, with you are a little freaked out by how comfortable I am with it. And I feel that you are struggling with this, but I know you have a willingness to learn. And I, I think that you're actually going to be a better fit in this role than I would be. And it wasn't because like, I'm so much smarter in the area, but sometimes I want it. Like you just put people in this position and he, he get, he just kind of made people comfortable learning this stuff in a way that maybe it wasn't just because I was the ed tech lead, but I was the principal yeah. that they were always nervous around me. And I was like, I'm maybe part of the problem here. I feel like somebody that they feel they're struggling with will be actually better in this position. And he, yes. I, I loved him. And sometimes he would come to me and he would say, Hey, I don't know how to do this. Can you show me? Cause I got to show a staff. I said, absolutely. And I'd show yeah. up. He was just willing to learn. He was willing to appreciate. And I just, I love that man so much. And I, I miss him tremendously. And, and that's something that, you know, you had mentioned. And one of the things that we talked about before that really resonate with me is you talked about in your own school that I think you, and you said 
lower school. I'm assuming yeah. elementary. It's right? elementary, yeah. Elementary, right? And maybe I'm just we're just using different terminology. Uh, but you you said that there's a, a genuine care. Oh, that there is. Feel. And I and I feel that when we're teaching new things, when we're trying new stuff, people are more open to falling when they know people got their back. And so yes. like talk a little bit about some of your experience, you know, working with some of the, those teachers that you were talking about with me prior um, and just kind of that impact that they have on, on not only your, on the students at your school, but you. So I have been very blessed this year as my, I've been at uh, Lake Highland now for three, but this particular last school year was my first year working specifically with lower school teachers who are pre-K to sixth grade. And that's a different breed of teacher. Mm. I'm still learning them. I had 20 plus years in education in the middle school, which is a very different breed of student and teacher. And so my openness to learn them and their pedagogy and yeah. their sense of just getting all of these little tiny brains and bodies that just want to squirm and wiggle and do mm -hmm. to, to learn and do things with a whisper. Like I've never heard people who talk so quiet. Right. Right. I feel like I yell when I go into the classrooms, <laughs> but they're so welcoming of all the people to bring out the best in the students that they've helped bring some of the best out in me because they've allowed me to help learn from them as well. They're tech hesitant. It's, it's lower school. They're very paper driven. They're yeah. tech hesitant, but they, we, we are building that trust so that they are less afraid to come and ask me questions because I've been asking them questions for a year. I love, I love that. And I, I, as, as I get older and I feel, I feel like I'm, I don't this, I feel like this is aging me quite a bit. The more calmness I can have in my learning, the more better. quiet I can have in my learning. I feel that I learn better. I used to be very adamant that I had to have like audio in the background. Yeah. And now I, there's sometimes I'm just kind of, I'm just, I just need silence. I just need like, I, need, I need that. Yeah. I you know need I mean? that zone. I need to be in that zone and that zone is getting quieter and quieter the older yeah. I get. And, and you know, that, that is actually something really beneficial to a lot of kids because I mm -hmm. feel like it's, it's sometimes hard when your heart rates up and you know, some really gifted elementary teachers that it feels like they can have chaos one second and then they could just like, just calm everyone down. I, just, I, I have never heard people speak so quietly. We are a responsive classroom school yeah. and um, they, they don't raise their voice ever. And they talk so quietly that at the end of the day, remember, my voice box used to be just beat and tired from straining to be heard above all the children, but they're just so quiet. <laughs> I love that. I, just, I love that. All right. So you are, you actually, tomorrow you are, yes. there's a conference you said that you're yes. going to, and you told me you're presenting yes. on, I think two different topics. So I, I want to actually ask you about both of them. So one was on AI that yes. you talked about. Tell me, tell me about what you're doing with people tomorrow. Cause this is obviously a major conversation that's happening in education right now. Oh, it's, it's huge. What are you talking about um, with your group tomorrow? So our spin on the topic tomorrow is using um, AI as a research superpower yeah, and using it in a positive way, not in an I gotcha way. Right. right. And if it's introduced in small pieces in all the classes, you know, in low stakes activities like a this or that by showing up some images of AI created things versus non AI and, you know, talking about prompt engineering to really get that critical thinking to ask it the best questions so that it can get you started or, you know, tone up, tone down anything that you've already written, using it in a way that's good. Yeah, we, there's a, this is going to sound weird. There, there is a, there's a South Park episode. <laughs> Isn't this start off great? There's a South Park episode and the, the, the animation is so terrible on South Park yeah. <laughs> and it's so minimal that they can actually do stuff that's really relevant and topical yeah. quickly, right? Which is kind of one of the benefits of the, 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 the animation being the way it is. And I'm going to ruin the episode, but they, all the kids figure out chat GPT mm -hmm. and they started actually using it to do their essays. And so they're just writing these 
high level essays that are just mind blowing. And the teacher, I think it's Mr. Garrison <laughs> is like, Oh my God, my kids are like writing these essays and I'm like having trouble keeping up. And then, uh, basically his partner says like, Hey, have you heard of this chat GPT thing? And so he's using chat GPT to assess the kids, not knowing that they're using <laughs> GPT to actually write the essays. Right and it's just kind of like there, there's benefit. And there, there's a video I saw, I can't remember. It's a, um, is a YouTuber. His name is minority mindset. That's what his, uh, it's, I think it's Jasper Singh. He, it's his, his channel is called minority mindset. And he talks about, um, AI being kind of like a second brain mm -hmm. and seeing it as something that not to overtake and replace the stuff that we're doing, but something that we can utilize to kind of help us in this space. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm actually about in the process of like writing a, a blog post about this. There is some benefits of this, but it's also instead of like just jumping and talking about the AI stuff, I think it's really important for our schools or communities to say like, what are the basic things that we need to, to be able to do? Like, for example, if you use chat GPT, uh, you have to know how to read and write. I think that's kind of an important aspect and that's like a basic skill that every kid should be able to do. Um, but you also have to know how to ask good questions, right? Yes. So th there's, those are elements of that too. Now, the other one you said was about return on investment in ed yeah. tech tools that you're using. Tell me about that session and what you're doing. So this is going to be uh, a round table yeah. because the frustration right now with ed tech tools is that the cost is just skyrocketing. Yeah. And part of that we understand completely because the use of these has skyrocketed since the world broke in 2020 with COVID and everything shut down and people started using it more. Right. But the cost is now outliving its effectiveness. Like you, you're not ever going to be able to afford this at the prices that they're charging. And so many of the tools are stepping over each other to do the thing the other tool did. Like hmm. kind of stay in your lane to keep the, the budgets down a little bit because you don't need a tool that does everything. Yeah, and that, you know, okay, so maybe I'm going to ruin some stuff here, but <laughs> I, I struggle with this too because I feel that being someone who's focused on innovation, I am adamantly against just new stuff all the time. All the time. And part of the problem is, is that innovation to me is about doing new and better things, but that means you have to have time mm -hmm. and you have to be able to go in depth with stuff. Whereas the perception of innovation, innovation to some people is always being on the cutting edge and always doing the newest stuff. And a lot of times we get so caught up on doing the new that we are never, we never got good at the old stuff. Right. And so, it, it seems that are we are we being driven by companies that are trying to make money or are we being driven by doing really deep learning and figuring out what are the best things that support the, that stuff right because i think you know a lot of people that do ed tech tools have never been in education like they, they like other than they were a kid and then if they're if they were like basing what they did in school as their experience as their experience. They're often making these ed tech tools that replicate paper, um, digital versions of what we did in paper when they were kids in the eighties. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. you know, like where, how do we, how do we kind of assess that too, where we're not just, you know, kind of giving in to just doing the latest stuff when it isn't. And I, I said this yesterday to a group I was working in Atlanta, uh, I, I don't think we should do old stuff just because we've always done it, but I don't think we should do new stuff just because it's new. Just because right? it's new. It's not, yeah. it's, no. So like, where, where do you kind of see that? Like, how do you, how do you, you know, in your role, I'm sure you have to at least give us some advice, if not make some of those decisions. How do you kind of filter out between like, Hey, this is probably a little too much. It, there could be some benefits, but do we really need this for everybody? Like, how do you kind of figure that out? Uh, I like to start with the end process. Like, what is the end goal of this? You know, if your end learning goal is for students to know X, Y, and Z, then what's the best way for them to show that? Right. Right. Just, you don't like teachers always come to me and they go, Hey, I just heard about this new thing and I want to use it with this. Okay. But does it fit that? Or do you just want to use it because it's bright and shiny? Yeah. It, you know, it always goes back to the learning. What is the goal of the learning? And I think sometimes that message gets muddied because parents want to see the latest and greatest, you, you know, 
especially in the independent school world, it, a lot of learning seems to be like a dog and pony show so, so that it looks good. Right. But is it really the best for what the students need? Well, and that that's, you know, one of the arguments I've made. So I had an Apple II C. My, my dad bought it for my brother and I, and we shared it. And I remember my brother making me sign a contract that he owned 75% of it. Like, I'm not even kidding. He made me actually sign a contract. I was probably like seven and that he owned the majority of the computer. So like that, that was a thing. And so, um, when, when you look at the stuff, I actually look at what I could do with the Apple to C. it was a lot. I actually felt I was better with technology then than I am now mm -hmm. because to get the computer to do stuff, you, you had, had to, to tell programming, it. you had to do certain things. Whereas, you know, for me, editing video on my phone on CapCut is pretty easy, right? And right. like, it's just like, hey, th throw in seven pictures here and it'll look like amazing, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's one of the fears that a lot of people have is that, and maybe we're not making this explicit connection is that kids aren't getting better at the technology and they're not way smarter than technology they are. The technology is becoming so good that it actually doesn't, we don't need to think anymore. Yes. And I think that's causing some of the issues in school is that like, I don't really need to think because the, the, I'll just get somebody, somebody really, really smart made it so easy for me. Right. Yes. As, and so like that, I think that's one of the things that we have to always kind of guard ourselves against is making sure that, you know, as the technology gets better, we're still focusing on wisdom and actually deep learning in our classrooms, not just making stuff look good because really the person who put the program together is the one that's making us look good, not necessarily us filling in a template. Is, yeah. that, fair to say? is that fair to say? No, totally. Last year at this same conference that I'm going to tomorrow, um, I did a presentation with my friend Jennifer Vasilis, and she and I were focusing on taking ed tech tools back and going back to those first steps that you learned about when you were building a lesson plan. Right. right. You want to make sure that you have that hook. You want to make sure that you can engage, that you can do some analysis, you can reflect. And we did it all with technology. So it's not the word heart. I love that. <laughs> well, we, hey, we Jan, Jan, it has been awesome to get to know you. And uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, connecting with you more, seeing yeah. Magic Games. Uh, hopefully, I'll get to see you uh, at Lake Highland Prep at some point and uh, be able to connect with your staff and say hi to Jason when you're there. But thank you so much for being on the podcast. I know that you're, you're spending your time, um, you know, in your summer doing this. So I, I just really want to thank you. And uh, everyone, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Make sure you connect with Jen. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning more from you and, and connecting with you and your community. So thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks so much.